So the addressee is the person to whom the um, this whole thing is addressed, which is the board of directors. Um, then you have the auditor's opinion. This is where they state the opinion. Um, then you come to the basis of opinion. The basis for opinion, as the name suggests, this is where you give the reasons for the opinion you give. You know, but it includes other details like um, whether the auditor is independent um, or the auditor has fulfilled ethical responsibilities, you know, whether they've, you know, been able to gather sufficient and appropriate evidence to give the opinion. So that is the basis for the opinion, right? The basis for the opinion. You have the going concern side of things, right? We all know what going concern, can anyone, Okay, I've already asked this before, so I'll ask again. So if there are any going concern, if it's, that's why I said, if applicable, um, going concern or material uncertainties, the auditor considers that the adequate disclosure about the material uncertainty has been made in the financial statements, you know. If there are any issues relating to going concern stuff, you talk about it. And if there are any going concern issues or material uncertainties, which casts doubts on the entity's ability to continue into the foreseeable future, you have to um, talk about it. This paragraph will deal with that. Then you have critical audit matters or key audit matters. In the US they say critical, other places they say key, all the same thing. Um, these are challenging areas that the auditor experienced when it came to the audits. Complex challenge, sorry, complex challenging areas, right? And um, the auditor will talk about them. You know, so areas like revenue, you know, those dicey accounting areas like revenue recognition, you know, you see them in key audit matters. Or it could be any, could be related party transaction. You know, these are key, any play, any area where the auditor had feels was critical. And critical means it's complex, it's unusual, it's probably significant as well. Other information, you know, you know, here you put in any other information, you know, that you you may deem fit into the auditor's report. So these are some of the areas, right? If I go back to our thing, you have the title, you have the addressee, you have the auditor's opinion, you have the basis for opinion, key audit matters, you know, responsibilities for the financial statements. I'm sure by now you know who is responsible, which is management. The auditor's responsibilities to, you know, is responsible for giving the opinion, gathering the audit evidence and all that. You know, then you state the name of the engagement partner. Then the rest is sad. Signature address date. Yeah, so responsibilities for the financial statements. Um, we said it's management that is responsible for preparing the financial statements. The auditor's responsibilities, like we talked about, um, I mean, we've talked about it several years to issue the auditor's reports um, and all of that. So we've talked about auditor's responsibilities, so I wouldn't want to go into that too much. Um, then again, the name of the engagement partner and all that. So, yeah. Any questions on that? Hello, sir. Why do you keep saying um, the rest is sad? Is there something that's... Oh, it's an acronym. Okay. 
It's an acronym. So I, the acronym okay. I used to remember is SAT. Oh, okay. Signature, address, and date. Okay. Mm. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I thought yeah. maybe it might be useful to someone. I, I usually yeah. use acronyms to remember stuff in audits. Mm. Anyway, by by asking, I'm sure that will, that will yes. ring a bell in the examination room. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's All true. Right. That's true. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit more about key audit matters, right? So like we said, key audit matters um, is regulated by ISC 701. And the whole idea of this key audit matters was to make the auditor's report more informative and useful for the intended users. Um, key audit matters must be communicated in the auditor's report of public interest entities. You know, and also when the auditor is required by law to communicate such matters. So when we say a public interest entity it means these things. One, the um, companies that have made invitations to the public for shares mutual funds, investment advisors, you know, those kind of companies. Um, yeah, so I think we talked about key audit matters. What you need to know about key audit matters, not a lot of chewing and pouring, but when we say something is a key audit matter or what some people have called a critical audit matter, it's simply a matter that as the auditor was going through the audits, you realize that this matter is a complex matter, right? Um, it's an unusual matter. It's a challenging matter to deal with. You know, there are some things in accounting that are quite challenging in terms of how it is recognized and all of that. Um, the, those are the matters we are talking about here. It seems I have a love for key audit matters. So these are those matters that in the auditor's professional judgments were of most significance, you see. So complex and usual significance in the audit of the financial statement. Key audit matters are selected from matters communicated with those charged with governance. Notes, this note is very, very important. Note, key audit matters or CAMS are defined with reference to the auditor. Please remember this, key audit matters are defined with reference to the auditor, not the user. That is the areas that require significant auditor attention. You know, sometimes you think of critical aud key audit matters, you think that maybe these are things that were key to the management. No, areas that require significant auditor attention, you know. Um, are defined as CAMS. So ISC 701 explains that in determining CAMS, the auditor shall take into account areas of higher risk, higher assessed risk of material misstatement, significant areas that have significant auditor judgments. Right? Um, you know, these are areas where you consider as key. So key audit matters must be communicated. And in communicating, you must say why the matter was considered to be key and how the matter was addressed. Any questions so far? Any questions so far? No, sir. Okay. Hey. No, please. Okay. Okay, now let's talk about um, 
Oops, oops. Sorry, I'm trying to. Let's talk about interaction between CAMS ISC 705 and ISC 517. Um, what you should know here is that, just to summarize the slide for you, what you should know here is that um, critical, why do I keep on, I'm familiar with the word critical, key audit matters are not a substitute for expressing a modified opinion. Right? It's very, very important. Key audit matters. It's not like maybe if you have to express a modified opinion, you don't express it, then you go and talk about key audit matters. They are not a substitute. <laughs> they are not, please. Always remember that. They are not a substitute for expressing a modified opinion. They are not. Now, for those who have heard emphasis of matter, emphasis of matter, what is emphasis of matter? You know, when we say emphasis of matter, right? You we might have heard emphasis of matter um, and um, other matter paragraph. So what's the difference, right? When you hear emphasis of matter, it means that a matter is being emphasized. I know this is, sounds like tautology, but it will help you. When you hear emphasis of matter, it means a matter is being emphasized. Emphas it means that when you say a matter is being emphasized, the question you ask where? It means that a matter has been raised in the financial statement or somewhere in the disclosures that is being emphasized, you know. Maybe something has been highlighted and it's now being emphasized. So it has been raised somewhere and it's being emphasized. It has been raised somewhere in the financial statements and it is being emphasized. Now, when you talk about other matters, it means that it hasn't been raised anywhere in the financial statements, but you are bringing it up. So that's the difference, right? So here I said the objective of an emphasis of matter paragraph is to draw attention to matters included in the financial statements and related disclosures, which in the auditor's judgment are fundamental to users' understanding of the financial statement. So yeah, you need to emphasize that matter. So the auditor may wish to highlight or draw further attention to their relative importance, you know. So in that case, you are emphasizing the matter. You are emphasizing the matter. Um, you are emphasizing the matter. The matter already has to be in the financial statements and in related disclosures. ISA 706 has been revised to reflect the fact that matters needing highlighting as fundamental to the user's understanding may now be determined as CAMS or key audit matters. The auditor may wish to highlight or draw further attention to their relative importance by listing them as the first CAM or by including additional information in the CAM description. <clears throat> Emphasis of matter paragraph shall only be used to highlight matters that are not considered to be CAMS. So here the distinction is being made. So hence they are not highlighted in the CAM section of the auditor's report. Is the distinction clear? So when you say an emphasis of matter paragraph, it's basically emphasizing something or you know, um, talking more about something that has already been stated in the financial statements or in the related disclosures, you know, does it make sense? Okay. 
So like I said, other matters as defined by ISC 706 relate to matters other than those presented or disclosed in the financial statement. Very simple. Now let's move on to the modified auditor's report. We talked about unmodified. Now let's look at the audit, uh, modified auditor's report. <laughs> Now, when we say a modified report, right? <laughs> Sorry. Before issuing a modified report, the auditor shall discuss with management the reason for the modification, right? Um, so here, basically, when we say a modified um, report, you are saying that um, everything was fine except for something or some things or something, usually something. An auditor's report is said to be modified whether either a matter arises which does not affect the opinion given by the auditor, but which gives rise to an emphasis of matter paragraph or an other matter paragraph in the auditor's report. Right? So when we say a modified auditor's report, um, we are talking more about um, a modification that has been done to the report based on, you know, the auditor's own opinion. Based on the auditor's opinion. Now, um, to give a more technical definition to um, um, because I believe that if you understand what a modified opinion is you'll be able to understand what um, what a modified auditor's report is. So when we say a modified opinion, we are simply saying that um, which is quite similar to anyway. Let me not confuse you. Um, when we say when we say um, When we say a modified opinion, um, we are saying that the financial statements um, overall show a true and fair view, except for, you know, except for some matter that does not. So you look at the financial statements and you say that overall, we talked about unmodified, right? Unmodified, we said that the financial statements overall in more all material respects show a true and fair view. There are no issues at all, right? Uh -huh. But with the modified, it means that there's a slight issue somewhere. Does it make sense? Oh, I'm sure you, you guys want a definition, definition. I'm, I'm more interested in you understanding. So please come again. Okay. When we say a modified opinion, when we say a modified opinion, um, we are simply saying that, first of all, I hope everyone got the meaning of an unmodified opinion. Right, and we said an unmodified opinion. It means that there was literally no issue with the financial statements, according to the auditor, in all material respects. Um, in all material respects. Um, sorry. In all material respects, um, everything was okay. Right. So, but for a modified opinion, for a modified opinion, what we are saying is that, okay, let, let me just hold that thought because I have a slide that will explain it perfectly. But let me, okay, let me just go to that slide. I think that will help everyone. 
when we say an unmodified, an unmodified opinion or an unqualified opinion, you can we have unmodified or unqualified opinion. It means that the financial statements overall in all material respects show a true and fair view of the financial statements. It means that everything is literally okay, right? When we move to qualified or modified opinions, right, then what it means here is that the financial statements are materially misstated. So if you look, if you look at this table here, this simple table here, right? When you see an auditor give a qualified or modified opinion, it means that the financial statements are materially misstated, but they are not pervasive. <laughs> These are technical terms. So when we say material, it means that you know what material is, right? When we say material, a material misstatement, it means that the misstatement is quite significant. When we say it's pervasive, it means that it affects other parts or other accounts in the financial statements. So it means that it's not just material, but it is extremely material and it's going to affect other portions of the financial statements. So if it's, when we give a qualified or a modified opinion, what it means is that the financial statements are materially misstated. Materially misstated, but it's just not pervasive. You know, that's why I use the term except for, right? Everything is okay except for some, some, some parts or some, except for some portion of the financial statements. Now we give an adverse opinion where the financial statements are materially misstated and it's also pervasive. It means that, you know, it's like maybe like, a, it's like a saw, a saw that has spread to several parts of the body. So it's, it's not just material, but it's pervasive. You know, when we say corruption is pervasive, it's like ingrained, it has affected other parts of the financial statements. Uh -huh. So when you say qualified, the even though the financial statements are materially misstated, they are not necessarily pervasive. They are not pervasive. Uh -huh. I hope that makes sense. Does it make sense? Does it not make sense? It makes sense. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. So that's this table is very, very important because this qualified modified thing can be confusing sometimes. So an auditor will give a qualified or modified opinion if the financial statements are materially misstated or if, um, if the auditor is not able to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence, right? But you only give a modified or a qualified opinion if it's material, but not pervasive. You only give um, adverse opinion and disclaimer of opinions when it's both material and pervasive. It means that the issue is serious. It's very, very serious. Uh -huh. So that's why I wanted to draw attention to this thing, extremely important, extremely important. Okay, so we've already talked about um, the emphasis of matter paragraphs and other matter paragraphs. Um, I, like I said, an emphasis of matter paragraph is used to draw the reader's attention to a matter presented or disclosed in the financial statement. See, so it's we are saying that here and here again. So, yeah, what are some of the circumstances? Like, it's usually when there's an, an uncertainty relating to a future litigate for relating to the future outcome of a litigation, a significant subsequent event to draw attention to a major catastrophe. You know, you use a um, you use the, um, what do you call it? 
use the emphasis of matter paragraph in that case. We've already talked about emphasis of matter and matter paragraph, so I wouldn't want to go into it too much. Please, is, is it making sense? <laughs> is it making sense? Is it difficult? If the explanations are difficult, please let me know. Just say yes in the chat. If it's okay, just let me know. If it's difficult, just say yes, 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 yes. It's okay to. <laughs> Okay, now let's move on. Okay, so when we say, um, so this table is very, very important, right? Uh -huh. This table is very, very important. So you, when we are modifying, you know, modified or qualified, it's material but not pervasive. It means that there's an issue, but the issue, you know, it's not that serious. Um, uh, so if you are giving it over 10, if you unmodified, unqualified, you say it's a 10 over 10, maybe qualified, modified, you say maybe 7 over 10. Adverse opinion, disclaimer of opinion, maybe you say 1 over 10 or 2 over 10, uh, something like that. So qualified opinions. A qualified audit opinion shall be given in the opinion of the auditor where there is a material misstatement or a limitation of scope. On the financial statement, it's material, but not pervasive, so you see. Qualified opinions are sometimes called except for, uh, that's what I wanted to say, except for opinion, because the auditor's report shall state that in the auditor's opinion, the financial statement give a true and fair view, except for the matter or matters described in the report. Fantastic. You know, so everything is given a true and fair view, except for so and so, maybe except for maybe provision for bad debt, it doesn't look right to us. Now, what's the meaning of pervasive? So a matter will be material, but not pervasive. When the auditor encounters a material problem um, with one or more specific items in the financial statement, but the remaining items as a whole provide a true and fair view. But when we say pervasive, it means that they are not confined to specific elements. You know, they are not confined to specific elements. You know, it means that what is happening here is that you encounter this problem with one or more items in the financial statement, then it becomes pervasive. The difference between material and pervasive is a matter of judgment. So someone might be asking, so how do we know? How do we know? It's a matter of judgment. There are no absolute cutoff points. And you are looking at something like this. Now you have limitations on scope. This occurs when the auditor is unable to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence about something that is material. Like a limitation on scope, it means your scope is being limited, right? So things that limit your scope, for example, circumstances beyond the control of the entity, such as when the entity's accounting records have been destroyed. When the entity's accounting records have been destroyed, how do you do your audits, right? That's one. Circumstances relating to the nature or timing of the auditor's work. So for example, when the auditor is appointed too late, it may not even give him the chance to perform some audit procedures. Then you have limitations imposed by management. That is when the management of the client's entity may prevent the auditor from obtaining the audit evidence. So sometimes the management does not want to give the auditor the information. You know. So in situations where the management is imposing the limitation, you know, the auditor has to ask the management to remove the limitation. If management refuses to do this, um, they must consider alternative procedures and must communicate with those charged with governance.
All right, just give me a minute. Now let's talk about the impact of going concern on the auditor's report. What is the impact of going concern on the auditor's report? Now, if indications are found, we suggest that the going concern basis um, might not be appropriate for preparing the financial statement. The auditor is required to consider the implications for his auditor's report. So very, very important. Um, sometimes going concerned will have an impact on the auditor's report. So, so it's, it has an impact in two ways, right? The form of the report will depend on the auditor's judgment. There are two possible views you could take. The use of the going concern assumption is appropriate by material uncertainty exists, or the use of the going concern assumption is inappropriate. Right, so where does the use of the going concern assumption is appropriate by material uncertainty exists? Let's talk about that first. So in a situation where the auditor considers that the going concern assumption is appropriate, but a material uncertainty exists, he must consider whether the financial statements adequately describe the principal events or conditions that may cast significant doubt on the entity's ability to continue as a going concern, right? So here, the key thing you need to know is here that where there's a material uncertainty, you need to understand whether what are the principal events and the conditions um, that cast a significant doubts on the entity's ability to continue as a going concern and disclose that, you know, disclose clearly that there's a material uncertainty. You know, you need to communicate that there's a material uncertainty. where the financial statements have been prepared on the going concern basis, but the auditor considers the going concern assumption is inappropriate, the auditor shall express an adverse opinion. You know, in situations where the use of the going concern assumption is inappropriate, then the auditor shall express an adverse opinion because we don't see a future with this company, right? This company is going to crash. You know, the auditor may also give an unmodified opinion if the financial statements have been prepared on an alternative acceptable basis. You know, so if there's an alternative basis that they prepare the financial statements, um, and there's adequate disclosure, then they can go ahead and give an unmodified opinion. So before we end this class, I would like to let us look through some, um, some situations and the conclusion or the impact of the conclusion, right? When there's a limitation on scope, you know, what does it lead to? Like we said, they can lead to a qualified opinion, a modified opinion, a disclaimer of opinion. When the assertion made by the responsible party is not fairly stated, it can lead to a qualified or an adverse opinion. 
when the subject matter has been materially misstated, it can lead to a qualified or adverse opinion, depending on the pervasiveness. When the criteria are unsuitable or the subject matter is not appropriate, it can lead to a qualified or adverse conclusion. You know. So these are situations, but once you understand um, this, um, what do you call it, what is it? Once you understand this um, slide, you have a handle over which opinion to give. Okay, any questions for me? Any questions for me? Any questions for me? No, please. <laughs> okay. Um, so I just wanted to know, is it possible for us to meet um, anytime this week? Yes, sir. Sure. So um, that's that's Wednesday work. Yes, please. Wednesday work. Okay. Uh, personally, yes. Personally, yes. Okay, Wednesday. Okay, then let's do Wednesday at six thirty. Wednesday. Or Wednesday at six. Uh, 6.30. I think 6.30 is fine since most of us will be commuting from work. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 But how is preparation going? How, is, how are you people preparing? I you're heading to your advice. Okay. But is the past question getting easier or is it getting difficult? <laughs> oh, the part of that is difficult we, we read it like you're reading a test book oh, mm -hmm. I read it like I'm reading a test book okay yeah because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to finish up early so that we can see if we can have some time for summary and then at least brush through some questions yeah before you go for exam so yeah, that's the plan. So I wish you guys the best. Keep preparing. I know you guys so far, so keep preparing. But I'm Makes trying sense. to I'm trying to leave some time for some maybe some past questions and some tips. And then okay, sir. Okay. So have a good weekend and enjoy your Thanks. week, actually. Okay, bye. Thank right. you, sir. Thank you, sir. Bye. Thank you, sir.